Greetings, 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 and welcome to Heal Talk Tuesdays. And this is Lisa. We are live on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me allow me to start from the beginning. It is a, a perfect timing for October 1st, the 01, to restart the whole thing like this. Welcome to Real Talk with Lisa. This is absolutely an honor for me to have Maris here with me, my guest for today. But give me a permission for me to introduce Maris uh, literally the way she deserves to. So Maris, bear with me for just a moment. Maris, comes from this uh, mindset uh, to marketing. She's spent the last 30 plus years. She's not, uh, she's not a spring chief. But this lady brings innov innovative uh, collaboration and voices to issues, causes, and brands. She's worked from uh, leaders, companies, corporations, New York's, uh, the top of the list working with the public and private sectors from boardrooms to classrooms. She's worked for companies and corporations to nonprofits. The thing about Maris is her leadership expertise in business relationship, marketing, change and cultural inclusion. And as a keynote speaker, she thrives on making an impact. I've known Maris, and one of the things I can say is when it comes to relationship, she talks about this R factor. And today we're going to talk about the R factor. What is the R factor? But more than that, Maris has been involved with Olympic organizers, Harvard Kennedy School, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and served as lead advance for the White House and celebrities across the country. So and that's just a synopsis of who my guest for today is. And with that, I want to say Maris is a friend. Welcome to the stage, Maris. I'm thrilled to finally be here because we were just talking about this before we came on that we met three years ago, right? Three, mm -hmm. either three years ago through Secret Knock. And um, and we've been talking about, I, in fact, one of the first experiences I had with you was I met you there downstairs in the lobby through some mutual friends. And then I saw you the next day, I think it was, or even that same day, head out to the porch, to the balcony. And I said, oh, what are you doing? And you said, oh, I'm doing my real talk. I said, what? What are you doing? And I thought that was so, I was so impressed for two reasons. One, that you were being consistent and that you were taking time away from being at this event that you knew was connection and meeting people and being poured into and just really beautiful and took the time to really be in your discipline and consistent action. I was really very impressed with that. And I'm impressed with how you've continued it over the years because I've watched it touch people. And I've been the beneficiary of you doing these on a weekly basis. And um, so thank you. Thank you for what you're continuing to do and your, and your hypnotherapy work and your healing work across the board. So I really honor you as I've had some time to get to know you and your work over the years. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. Actually, Heal Talk Tuesdays and Real Talk uh, has been around for almost six years, consistent. And I've only missed, I think, about six episodes, if not five episodes in the entire six years. Amazing. Um, I like consistency, but more than that, there's three types of people. Those who are interested in certain things, those who are committed, and those who are really obsessed. And I don't, I think I don't go into the obsession part, but consistency is one of my things that I am committed to. And I call it, I am quite tenacious. <laughs> You, we, we we share that. And I also I love that about you because you're you're very clear at all times the mission you're on. And mm -hmm. and and I love that. And then you also allow this space of organic just to allow things to flow and kind of just be. And there was one point, I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but there was one point where I saw you move through the room. It was at um it, you know what? I, I don't remember, Lisa, if it was camp? a no, I don't you know, not that moment. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, 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 not that moment. No, it was another, it, it might've been at Secret Knock. I think it was somewhere we were together. It might've been Secret Knock. But I watched you, we're a little bit the same in that we really kind of watch what's happening in a space. We kind of take it in. And then we kind of just move through. And I watched you do that with such, with such grace. And I thought, you know what, that's, I get to get to know that person. So it actually must have been that first year. It must have been when I saw that first year. I, I just, I'm remembering visually that experience. So anyway, I don't think I've ever shared that with you, but it was beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, this is talk, real talk. And part of real talk is we've known each other for three years and with the high regard that I have for you and also for your husband, Ken, uh, I wanted to talk about relationships because your R factor, which is four quadrums, is about relationships. But first and foremost, how did the two of you meet? <laughs> because you are a very strong woman. Uh, it's like you are not only strong, but have a heart-centered, compassionate. You come across compassionate and other times like you're like whoop, straight in and which reminds me sometimes of me. <laughs> and so how does Maris from who you are comes to meet this musician and merge together? <laughs> You know, mer merge is good. So Ken and I, Ken and I talk about living an integrated life versus a balanced life, because you know, balance is all about teetering, and we're constantly in the middle trying to teeter. And so, in our leadership work, we just talk about, you know, what it's not about that. And so, when you talk about merging, it's interesting because Ken always says, "This is his line. I'm going to steal it from him." Ken always says, "We did the little M before the big M." So we merged our businesses before we actually got married. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and he and, and I'm sure he's watching right now. So my love, that's a nod to you. Um, so it's interesting. Ken and I were both part of a global youth leadership organization that used music and performing arts as a vehicle for social impact. Okay. It, and it's it's called Up with People. And um, and up with people worked in I don't even know I was in I have worked in forty countries over the years so my early travel with up with people as a student um, was really remarkable because we were traveling and living with families in every city and it was all about the service impact and building bridges of connection and communication among people from all walks of life so I've been in this relational space many many yeah. many years and um, and so Ken and I met he was one of the original singer songwriters of the organization. Organization. Okay. And um, and we we were not at all connected then, but I knew who he was because he was the person, part of the group whose work we were actually performing on stage globally. And so, you know, popes and presidents and communities and all kinds of things. And so when we go into these communities and perform this, this show and really do this phenomenal community service work, a lot of Ken's music was on the stage that we were bringing to life with other people in the production. So, you know, that was how I originally was aware of him. And his sister and I happened to travel as part of the same organization. She was our cast nurse. And there were five groups that traveled globally. Fast forward many years later, I was actually working to launch their alumni association with about 20,000 alumni globally. And as a volunteer, I stepped into that space and I started to sit on up with people's board of directors and Ken and I reconnected just as friends. And then we were both going through our divorces. He, um, a little bit after mine, mine had already, you know, kind of happened and we just connected as friends. And it was kind of one of those moments of, well, hang on, I'm aware of you. Oh, I'm aware of you in a whole different way. And, um, and the truth is, I resisted. I really, I really resisted initially because we both had the same circle of friends in that global environment and it was beautiful. And I also wasn't sure about what was possible. So the big question was, do I fear it or do I go for it and say there's something here and let's explore? And, um, and the truth is I resisted in the beginning and then realized, you know what, there were too many amazing connections between us and this heart-centered feel that we were just on the same page. And I thought, okay, all right, Lord, if this is where you really want me to be, I'm strapping in, let's go. And it's it's been it's been amazing. And um, and that being said, trust is an incredible thing when we've come from a place of hurt, pain, traumas, and dramas. Right? Which 
is a beautiful segue because October is one of the things, not only cancer, but it's domestic abuse. And I know you have worked with so many in the past, prior to all this, you were doing therapy, you were doing like you had a one on one, uh, what is that small business of your own, doing a lot of work. And because I'm all about empowering women, I think when we come to helping someone heal, so they can embrace themselves and then reclaim who they are. Because it's like my clients who come, they say, I I'm like walking like a zombie functioning. I'm functioning. And yet I feel like it's not me. So when you talk about trust, was the trust already built because of working together and you were friends and everything, or you had to come and trust yourself and say, I'm in Brady? Yeah, it, you know, it's it's a great question. I, I trusted the person Ken was because I'd been seeing him in so many circles and sitting on their board as I was and, and and connected over the years. And he was he was this phenomenal creative heart. I always trusted the grounding of who he was mm -hmm. um, as a person. I, I mean, that was easy. And to your point, I mean, I think that then when we stepped into this relationship and we started to explore it, the trust was equally about myself as it was about him, right? And because when we moved to that other level in a relationship, and, and look, I had been married for seven years before, I, we laughingly call that my practice round. And I learned a lot and I learned a lot from that marriage. And, and really in a lot of ways, I learned how to love initially from my first marriage. What I didn't learn was how to be vulnerable and let go. And the thing that really has been the most powerful experience in my relationship with Ken, which now really applies to our relationship in business, which applies to the teams that we lead in terms of, you know, in terms of coaching. And this whole message is when we learn to trust inside, our ability to trust vulnerability is much easier right? Because we've all come to where we are from this legacy of our past. You've got, you know, your, your cultural past. I have my cultural past that layers on top of it. And then our grandparents and our grandparents before them. So we all come from this legacy of our relationship with money, our relationship with work, our relationship with faith, our relationship with love. All of that comes before we almost ever step into the world because it's ingrained in a lot of ways. And so mine was, wow, okay, I have to be able to do it myself all the time. I get to be because I was raised as a strong, independent Leo girl from my dad. And I have two sisters and we're all very strong, independent women because my dad never had any little boys. My mom was independent. So stepping into a relationship where I could trust needing someone Believe. in a different way and release that. And Ken used to say to me in the beginning, I'm going to be here for you and you're going to learn to trust that. And I thought, well, that scares me because I don't want to be dependent on you. <laughs> and what I, and what I really learned is it's very mutual. And when we can allow its mutuality, then I could actually receive and Ken could receive and we could then both give compassionately and in kindness and in gratitude and still be our own independent selves. And that's been probably one of the biggest gifts of the relationship that we have that we also carry into our business because we work together 24 seven as well. Okay. And how do you take me time away? <laughs> how do you carve me time for you? Because it's one of the biggest things that I work with my clients and I say, take some me time because it's always about others it's about family it's about parents children work this that it, it's the outside but in order for us to heal within and truly we need some me time to come to know ourselves which it's like I met this couple at at the tour that we were and husband and wife they were saying that they have this a uh, beautiful daughter of theirs and she wants to go and live on her own and she wants to explore life before she gets married and I'm like wow 
you know, that's amazing. And I said, how old is she? And they said, she's 31 years old. And I'm like, and you're not letting her? It's like, but that's not in our culture. So when we talk about culture, because I know you come from culture and I come from culture, when do we allow women to become independent and yet be part of the culture? You know, I... I think the, so the independence thing is a given because it's where we get to be. We get to be independent and we get to own that independence. In that independence though, the most the most important pieces that we think, right, over the years, I thought over the years, handle it myself, be a lone wolfer, be in service to everybody else, which was really where my value came from. Right. So until your value comes from the inside out and you can recognize it versus the outside in, it's really tough to actually allow that time or to allow that self-care time because you just think I was in this constant mode of go, 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 go to next. What I, what I really, what I really learned is that one of my key principles, as you know, from, you know, from the R factor is respect. Respect. Yeah. And, and, and. As we were doing this work, when Ken and I realized that these kind of relationship rhythms were who we were together, I kind of stepped back and said, wow, respect actually means respecting what I need for downtime, right? I used to think self-care was a manicure and that that was just bogus. And now what I recognize is that that me time is my meditation in the morning and my gratitude practice. The 15 minutes that I take to go outside to put my feet on the ground and not mm -hmm. talk to anybody with a cell phone. You know, it's not this big, oh my gosh, I have to turn my life upside down. And I yeah. think that, I think sometimes women think, well, I just need to, you know, I, I just, I just have to take a vacation. Well, actually that's not the case. If we learn throughout the day to give ourselves that time, that grounding, that 15 minutes, that 30 minutes, whatever it is, and listen to my words, allow ourselves to be in respect with ourselves because that's how we also build respect for others when we can pour back into ourselves so yeah so for me that was a big one and my mom you know my mom who is this amazing amazing rest her soul human being um was this constant constant work and she'd come home she'd be on the phone at night in the morning she'd be you know on the phone before she went to the office and she was a clinical social worker and at one point during high school, I was having a really tough time because we had moved from New Jersey. I was in a private Hebrew school till I was 13. And we moved to Florida to this Bible Belt area. And I was like the only Jewish kid in this school. And I had a really tough time because the transition from private school to public school, mm -hmm. where you walk around the corner and kids are smoking and kids are making out. And I didn't know from any of that. And I was really struggling. And at one point I said to my mom, could you just give me an hour when you get home at night? And I remember that almost being the first time I heard my voice ask for support in that way. And, um, and her, her immediate response was startled. She was really shocked that I even asked. And she just looked at me and she said, I never knew you needed it. Because why? Because I'd spent my years being a lone wolf kid. I was fine. I had two older sisters. I was, you know, it was an interesting recognition. And what I've learned over the years is that that space to create connection here, to create and to ask for support, to seek it and be open to receiving it is almost the greatest caregiving gift self that we can do for ourselves, right? And even if that's saying to somebody, hey, you know what? Okay, if I come in 30 minutes late today, or hey, you guys good to be on your own, whatever that looks like. And yes, if it's a manicure, a massage, whatever it is, but I think it comes in other ways. And it comes with having coffee with someone. To me, this is time I'm taking out of my, my schedule. This is fulfilling for me. This yes. is absolutely pouring in because I get to, it's cool, right? And it, it's beautiful and we're having this time. So it's like being on the phone with you and having a visit. I know. Actually, one of the things that you just mentioned, the ask is uh, for our audience, uh, Maris and I are also in a private group, which I call it like a mastermind. Every two weeks we come together and it's a group of women that we come together to support one another, hold space for one another. And the beautiful part of it is we say, what do you need 
how can we support you? Because it's like supporting one another, it doesn't mean that I have to do anything huge, but supporting can be five minutes or it can be once we get off, I need to get on a phone with you for something different. Or it is something that within five minutes, everybody pours in their love or their knowledge and that person feels fulfilled, heard and supported. And I think that is one of the things that women, it's not coffee time, it's not going anywhere. It can be once a week, it can be once a month. Uh, so that's beautiful. Uh, your second R is responsibility, which I highly regard because I think when we take ownership and responsibility for not only our past, but our present, we do something wrong, take ownership of it, take responsibility because, you know, it's so easy to be a victim to so many things because the world does not stop. It's how we are impacted by what we take responsibility towards what's happening. For sure, so, for sure, yeah. But how does responsibility go into, which is the next one, reframing it? How do we reframe our mindset? Well, I think first, you know, responsibility is, my mom used to say, it's not always what you say, it's how you say it. And one of the things in responsibility is about communication, is about mm. clear communication, right? So when we're standing in responsibility and we are being responsible, right? Not doing responsible, we are being responsible. So this is about embodying what this is. And it doesn't mean, you know, I, I have this separation between empathy and compassion. It doesn't mean that we're wearing everybody's, what they're going through with empathy, it means we're creating an empowered space for people to be succeeding, to, for people to be able to problem solve and those types of things. So we're in a compassionate space. So when we look at responsibility, we say, you know what? It's about clear communication and it's about aligned expectations. So mm -hmm. in a personal relationship or in our business, if you're dealing with an issue at work, the likelihood is that at the center of any challenge and accomplishment are people right? People power business, people power personal lives, people power philanthropy. It's about people. So, so the fact is when people feel connected and we've created an experience where they feel good about us and that's our responsibility, then they want to work with us. They want to be connected with us. They want to be in a relationship with us, you know, as well. So the responsibility comes down to first, how am I being responsible to myself? Mm -hmm. Right? How am I communicating? What am I saying to myself? What messages am I sending myself, right? Because we can't take our words back. And part of being in response, right? Don Ruiz Miguel, thank you for agreements, right? Be impeccable with your word. And so expectations without agreement create premeditated resentment every time. And in communication- Let's say clear, that again for our expe audience. Expectations, expectations without agreement- Without an agreement create- Premeditated resentment premeditated resentment here's why meditated that means i've already thought about this yes but i didn't realize it yes and because okay. because we're making assumptions stepping into a communication we're making an assumption i am making an assumption that you're listening so that's a safe assumption that's one two is if i say to you lisa how come we didn't have the, I don't know, how come we didn't have, you know, the, the party that we were, you know, that was on our calendar that we were supposed to have. And we all never, we all never worked out the details. Right. Well, that was a big expectation on my part without actually having a solid communication with someone about who's planning it. How are we organizing it? And how are we, do you see what I'm saying? So the whole idea of clear communication and expectation is that when we set up a planning conversation, when we are clear in our communication, husband and wives, the assumption of you're doing the dishes, you're taking out the trash, you're picking up the kids. We are running teams all the time at home and at work, right? right? We're all leading, we're all like leading our lives. Don't you see the trash is full? Exactly. Why don't you just go and pick it up and do it? It's like, and, yeah. And now, and now, and now apply that to business. You're sitting in a meeting and someone says, okay, well, 
I knew I knew we had a weekly meeting and so and so always does the agenda and there's no agenda for the meeting. Well, that was an interesting assumption. So and so is not actually in the office. So nobody actually paid attention to the fact that we get to have an agenda. So there was just a big assumption that somebody else would handle it. So, you know, the the notion of clear communication changes everything because clear communication, right, builds trust, builds respect, builds clarity in all of our relationships at work or at home, whatever it is. So that responsibility piece is interesting. The other piece I think to responsibility is also accountability, right? right. It's the accountability piece. And, and you said it before, you know, taking responsibility. So it's interesting being in a responsible state. And, I, and I'm just going to go here for a second. Sometimes when we're in responsibility, it can be either weighted or wings. So we talk about the weight or the wings of responsibility. Here's an example. If someone has left you with a pile of trash. <laughs> Someone's left you with a pile of trash in the house, the party's over and all that trash is in your house. You're probably not feeling the wings of responsibility with that when you're feeling the weight of it. God, I gotta get this done. My parents are coming home in two hours. The kids are gonna be home. Everybody's gonna be here. I need to get the house cleaned. That feels like weight. Now, if you're standing in responsibility and you're gonna be in someone's wedding, and you're supporting them through their wedding, that's wings because now I'm in this space of sharing and flow and love with someone that's creating the wings of responsibility. And so I get to be sort of under it, soaring and lifting someone up. My general feeling is that we can always be in the wings of responsibility. If we feel the weight of it, it's because either one, we haven't aligned with our expectations with ourselves or someone else, or we're fearing what responsibility we have. Okay. So let's say, you know, so, let, let's say I'm going to speak at a big meeting. Yeah. You, you know, it's like, this is becoming like an educational thing. No, I'm just saying that's where my heart is. Like, that's my that's, struggle. I, I, that's I, I my understand. struggle. What, what I'm saying in a relationship, not everyone is going to stand and say, okay, what is your responsibility? What is mine? Because it's going to be a little bit of a, given and then and then we usually start communicating when things go wrong instead of from the beginning of right that's where those expectations come in <laughs> yeah and and so, you know, and you and you actually just you actually just said it just said it correctly so it's interesting part of that right part of that and the reason this has come up for me so much over the years is because you know, when you're leading in a family, it's joyful. And sometimes it's weighted with responsibility. You have a sick family member, you have something else going on. Oh my gosh, the bills have to get paid. Oh my gosh, are we going to have enough money to put the kids through school? That feels weighty, right? That's really weighty. And it also has wings because it's got joy with it. So it, it's interesting. It's been a big navigation for me over the years, because when we are in relationship with someone at home and your point is right it's not look how many people talk about the bank account before they get married everybody says oh my gosh Susie Orman always says oh my gosh you got to have separate bank accounts I'm like okay <laughs> but that wasn't something that was a big uh, that was a big thing for us so the responsibility piece is interesting and can fall into a couple of different buckets so when we if we because nowadays it's all about empowering, empowering. That's the biggest thing that is happening. Self-care, empowerment, and women who have stepped up in their lives and men who are saying there's, I mean, the workforce is a lot of women. And that's because we are noticing it or is it being seen more? Or is it because we have given ourselves more permission and literally women are more educated nowadays in all phases? I mean, doctors, attorneys, architects, uh, engineers in all phases. So it's not only being the feminine, take care of, uh, be a teacher or anything, not that I'm disregarding it. But when we look at it in the workforce that you 
and can go and help in the corporate world. Um, talking about responsibility, they still look to the team members because it's still a team. Corporation is a team. There is different levels of hierarchy. And I think the same levels of hierarchy are in the house, which is uh, the father, the mother, and then the children, and then the great grandparents or the aunts and everything. So there is hierarchy in all kinds of relationships. When we think about it, you talked about your mom being a social worker and she was busy working and taking care of those that she needed to tend to at work. Who was the influence in your life? Because today, um, kids are being influenced by celebrities and everything. It's not tangible books. It's become this. So how do we take someone and say, in reality, this is life? This is like the book you were talking about. You said, have you read A Touch of Madness? And I said, I'm reading four books. You were surprised that I even have a library card and I go to the library. I love When that. we talk about influence, what is influencing people nowadays? You know, I, I mean, I, I think the reality of what is influencing is equal to the question of who is influencing. And, um, and so I think that, um, I think that the media, so this is interesting. Many years ago, I was involved um, doing some work with Harvard and uh, US News. And we did a study. This is interesting. We did a study and we asked people to actually talk about how they feel about leadership in a number of different areas. Okay. And the two areas that people said they did not trust the leadership was the media and politics. Wow. This was a huge study. This was a, land, a landmark study. And I bring this forward because who do people, who are people influenced by? The media and politicians. And yet we don't trust them, right? As a general population, there's distrust there. Yet it's also where people are absorbing their most information. And so that creates a challenge. And that also creates an opportunity that says, okay, we know that all of us, I mean, all of us are getting information from television, my phone, my grandchildren, my, you know, I mean, from, from everybody, we're all being influenced by that. In the end, I think what's so important is that inside the circle that we keep close to us is a trusted circle. Mm. And so if it's a parent and a friend, so I talk about our life that Ken and I have these two circles in our lives. One is a trust circle and one is a skill circle. And the trust circle, like you would be in the trust circle. You know, you would be in the trust circle are people who are close to us, who we feel a connection that we know we could pick up a phone and say, yeah, I'm, I'm seeking support on something. The skill circle are people who also have the skills to move our business and our vision forward. And sometimes our trust people are in the same bucket. But that trust circle is very important. And the first place that that trust is that we, we work to learn to trust ourselves, but to have mm -hmm. a close circle, a community, a connection, it could be two people. But it's very important, no matter what, AI is going to happen, it has been happening for years. And here's the reality, this one-to-one, -one, the importance of the human connections not going away. In fact, it's going to be I more important not. than ever. No, it's going to be more important than ever. So when you say, how are we being influenced? Who is influencing us? What, what I really say to this is, don't ever stop making phone calls. Mm. Be sure you're meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one. Be sure this connection is happening because the phone, the phone connection is important for communication not as much for social media. That's entertainment and that's visibility and marketing. Okay, got it. But that is not how I live my life, right? So to really get grounded back into, okay, what turns my crank? Who turns my crank? What is the experience? And as long as we continue to have experiences and we are influenced by the people in our lives, and yes, books, I think it's really important to continue reading. And yeah, I've got a stack of book, uh, you know, books on my um, on my um, 
side table. And I've got this mix of the Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa, right, to the Pope, to, you know, heaven only knows who else, so to speak, to Dennis Waitley's The New Psychology of Winning, to our friend Larry Kasanoff's A Touch of Madness, to our book, The Art Factor, to, you know, you name it. And in the end, it's also about feeding ourselves with other people. It's the energy of humanity, the people energy and the people power that are that will continue to be our grounding. Amen to that, because no matter what, um, you know, I, I was uh, watching a movie called Long Story Short. Hmm. Uh, on the you recommend it? Back, you recommend it? I highly recommend it. It's a fluff movie, but when you re when you watch it i was crying on the plane because it touched my heart oh, i love it it was there's parts of it that you look at it and you go ah oh, okay 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 and then it's like deja vu because of a connection of human it's how we relate to someone and it was taking the, to the future and showing what's happening in the future. But this person waking up, it's like, I don't want to get there. This is what I want. This is what I want is right here, right now. How can I share my love and be present? And that's one of the things because everything, in, we are so busy being busy, we forget about here. It's one of my talks that I, when I went to Dubai was, uh, although there is AI, how do we incorporate EI, which is emotional intelligence with what is happening in reality? And that's exactly what you said. Picking yeah, and I, I, I love, I love that you brought that up. And because building on that, we, our focus is actually our I, relational intelligence. So here, I mean, right. <laughs> so here, here's the bottom line, how we relate, and this is never going to change. Let's mm -hmm. think about this. How we relate ultimately impacts what we create in our personal lives and our professional lives. Okay. Let's say that again. Ladies. How, how we how? relate. How we relate directly impacts what we create in our personal lives and our professional lives. Because we are continuously relating 24-7. Mm -hmm continuously relating and in our dream state with ourselves, right? So 24 seven, we're continuously relating. And as we relate, we're creating this connection that is building trust or tearing down trust. Yeah. Pretty simple, right? It's, it's a very simple formula, actually. Respect first is what establishes the grounding of a connection, right? First, that you respect the person you're speaking to or respect their position. Maybe you're reframing a political or other type of perspective. That depends, whatever that looks like. But, you know, it starts with a need, right? It starts with, we want something. I want a, I want a car. I want a relationship. I want a new job. I want to get uh, my door fixed. No matter what it is, there's still going to be a human connection because we're attached to a need. So we're either solving a problem or meeting a need. And every time we create a connection with someone, that gets banked. That's currency. And okay. that that builds trust and that currency ultimately, that's why Ken and I have such an incredible relationship is because at the grounding, it starts with respect. Then with respect, we build trust and we bank the currency of trust so that when things are crazy and hairy and messy, we still know we're going to be okay because we trust that we know what the grounding is. And that's exactly how all personal relationships and business relationships work. That's beautiful because uh, I remember long, long time ago, um, I was taught uh, the difference between loving and liking, especially when it comes to um, family Mm. and relationship i will love you but it it's not necessarily like the things you say or do and that's okay because my love for you does not change yeah yeah and that's a core base uh, realizing that when a relationship you this can change but this, the base, the foundation, what that is, it's like a house 
or a home. A house is just a structure, but what's inside the house is the home, which is built. Which is the uh, heart, right? Which is the that's heart. that right. That that's the heart. And I and I yeah. love I love how you're saying that. And you said something before that is very important to bring forward, and that is that we we spend our lives in a doing state. Mm -hmm. We haven't always been taught to be kind to ourselves and respect ourselves. Very often we're taught to be kind to others and respect others. Yes. Right. And so, and so when we're in that doing state for everybody else, we tend to not work here first. And that's what happens is people are going to respond to us. However, we're showing up. That's why we cringe even the body language and everything yeah. comes. Yeah. And so, and so to build, to build the confidence in, you know, young girls, we have three remarkable, incredible granddaughters and they are independent. They are heart centered. They are, you know, athletic. And why do you think they're like that? Where do you think that comes from? That comes from amazing parents. That comes from parents who have really been incredible grounding for these young girls. And, and, to me, that is also the wings of responsibility that Ken and I get to be in their lives and touch them and work with them on their leadership qualities as kids. And this is all the same stuff we bring to our leadership work, whether it's in corporations or with families or whatever. Paris, I hate to cut in, in the middle of what you're saying, but how many families really do have those parents that sit and do all that? Yeah. It, it's just like if we if I think about my parents or her parents, it, it's just now, maybe now we have more people uh, attuned to self-awareness and care and do that. I don't think that's how generations before were. They were so busy functioning and making a living that a therapy was not, I mean, it was not even a good thing. Therapy was a bad thing. <laughs> it was like for cuckoos or something. Are you crazy? You don't need therapy. The family will take care of this. So when you talk about leadership, this is a whole new generation we're talking about. And it that's is. beautiful to see, but, you know, let's not blame our, in the past, but how we move forward is to educate how to have better families and, right? You know, so, okay, so can we spend a minute there? Because I really, it's, it's interesting. There, there's, what's coming up for me here as you're talking about that is that when when we look at families and families show up in many different ways. And I'm not just saying a traditional mother and father. I'm not yeah. saying a traditional environment. Look, I have friends who lived in a house with six generations for years. You know, I mean, six generations, right? So they had their, their great grandfather, great, 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 like he was 104. I mean, so I'm like, what the heck? And they had great grandchildren in the house. And it was, and so, you know, I, you look at that environment and, and somebody might say, oh my gosh, was that, even functional. <laughs> and the fact is it was, it was pretty remarkable. Right. And so actually it was five generations. So pretty remarkable. The point being to that, that we all come from wherever we come from and mm. it's not, for, it's not bringing judgment forward. It's bringing the gifts of the legacy of that forward and recognizing it. Right. So here's the thing. I, I have a lot of legacy in my past. My great, 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 maybe grandmother <laughs> was um, with her brother started a matzah factory, a matzah company, um, kosher products, Jewish products. Now, in okay, New York? It, um, yeah, in, yes. And so can you imagine how many women were even doing that in that era, right? So I, I look at the entrepreneurship and the leadership and the heart-centered commitment to community and I am quite certain that that has really been innate in my family for generations. Ah. Um, and, and it really, and so that is something that has been carried forward. I always remember my grandfather, my grandmother, us. I mean, I think I went to my first rally at 14. So, wow. you know, I think the, so for me, the activism and the connection and the relationship gene was very much part of my legacy. So that was uh -huh. family. That being said, yes, mothers and fathers were busy and away from home. My dad was gone a lot, but he was also home and gave up golf so that his family could have, a, you know, a boat and be water skiing on the weekends because he wanted to be with family on the weekends. So I think, I, I think my perspective on that is not judgment. It's really the curiosity of how we've come to where we are 
and how we shift in shifting times. Relationships get to evolve, right? Relationships with family, relationships at work, our relationship has evolved, you know? And, and so I think the evolution is really critical because if we're not shifting, and let's be clear, part of why families, governments, businesses, are in the shape they're in is because they've resisted change. And change is happening no matter what. So how we respond or react to change ultimately impacts all of our relationships. If we're in reaction to change and we're afraid of it, then we're not in it, relating to it and planning it. If we're responding change to change, here. it's if we're responding to it, then we're actually in a more open relationship with change and we can maneuver differently in our families versus being in resistance, move right. differently in our work. So I think I, I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, past, I think families have, it's remarkable how families have operated. And, and I look now, I look, I, I look now at my daughter-in-law and my, and my son-in-law and they're busy as hell. I mean, it's just, we barely talk to them because they're so busy, but we are able to keep up with them. It's a whole new world. I may not be talking to them all the time, but I know what they're up to because I'm watching social and because at least I know I can keep up there so that when we do have the one-on-one -on -one time together, it's beautiful and it's, and it's grounded and we're hungry for it. And, um, and I think that's the human connection. And for people who don't have that kind of relationship with their immediate family, choose extended family, right? That's true. That it does like family. I remember I my love grandmother about, saying yeah. sometimes that uh, uh, good neighbors can be great family members. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think I think that the you know the structure is almost gone of what the tradition might have been before. And um, and you know we even look we had seventeen people at a Passover seder for the high holidays for you know we'd have eighteen people at my grandmother's house and and while some of that may not be happening in the same way community has shifted but the experience of it is equally important and people are equally as hungry for that and I think part of what we get to do as humanity is to recognize that we're all connected as humans first and the bottom line begins with relationships not with hard skills. It, relate, it, it starts with the people first. And that's where we get to be in everything we're doing. Amen to that. So in closing, if I were to say, what is next for Maris? What inspires you? What are you uh, looking to leave as your legacy? Um, let me reframe that. Well done. <laughs> oh, gold star. <laughs> what is next for Maris? <laughs> Just simple. Forget about legacy. Forget about the future. What is next for Maris? For Maris, not the business, not Ken and I, just you. So Lisa, you know what? I don't see them as separate. All of that is me. All of that in living and in living an integrated life, that is all me. And wow. I think, and I think that I, I think the challenge for me over the years is that I did create this big gap and this big separation. I don't do that anymore. Because the work that we do, what we get to bring to people, this evolution of relationships in business and in personal lives. It's one big life. We have one life to live, one body and one planet and to live in an integrated space. So when you say what's next, what's next is global travel and being able to touch lives in every single touch we make, because that's who I get to be in the world. Making more impact. With Ken, without Ken, to be really be able to know that what we're bringing is not about us. It's mm. about ultimately elevating and evolving humanity. Because if we don't, and if we aren't committed to that, and if we don't share that in community, the way you're doing it, the way the way our amazing Secret Knot community and other families and our Habitude Warrior community, all these other places, if we aren't continuing to surround ourselves and to create this ripple effect, then in 10, 15, 20 years, what we're leaving behind is barely going to be recognizable, right? So the legacy is about living it and touching it while we're alive. Yeah. Uh, I read something uh, 
a few days ago, the difference between leaving an inheritance and leaving a legacy. Mm. And I thought it was so beautiful because inheritance is here's the money. You can do whatever you want. Legacy is there is a meaning to it. I put my heart and soul into it. Now carry it forward. Exactly, exactly right. And that comes from a place of heart. Look, you know, we, the choices we make today all day determine our future. It's very simple. And when we put people first, because people are the power behind everything that we do, that's actually what's going to shift the planet is humanity first and kindness and connection and gratitude. That's what's going to shift the planet. And that's pretty much what's next for me is well, I'm in it. I'm in it. And that's, I'm committed to that. Ditto. <laughs> I know you are. And that's one of the reasons we're friends. <laughs> so on that note, this has gone beyond the half an hour, but I love it so much. Uh, I think we can probably speak for another half an hour to an hour and continue building upon this. Maybe we can do it another time um, and continue on, pick it up from here on. Uh, but I thank you for taking the time, carving this time to be with me. Yes, it's been coming and uh, I'm glad it is here today because uh, it's the beginning of autumn. It's my favorite season and I love the whole thing about our relationship and what you have created together. And on that note, on that musical note, <laughs> I want to say thank you to both of you and especially you for being a friend. Um, My thank honor. You to all our viewers, uh, if you liked this episode, by all means, would you go to YouTube because it will be YouTube. We will put the link, share it, subscribe so that I can bring more uh, guests that are impactful and loving and caring and compassionate as Maris. And thank you. Maris, and uh, I will be seeing you soon. And My honor and happy Thankful Tuesday. Yes, Thankful Tuesday. And until next week, I say goodbye. Thank you. God bless you. And may the universal light surround you always. Bye-bye. Thank you for being here. If you want to check out some of the testimonials that I've got, click right here. But if you want to go back and watch other videos from a week ago, two weeks ago, even a year ago, click right here. See you next time.